everyone. I am Belinda Cheeseborough, STEM Education Specialist at the National Museum of African American History and Culture. I'm here to share the stories of African Americans and the impacts they've had and continue to have on American culture because of their STEM contributions. Through the window and into the mirror is a video conversation series about the experiences of African American STEM professionals today. During this session, students will peer into the windows of the speakers' lives and learn from their lived experiences. They will also see parts of their culture and lifestyle mirrored in their stories. To everyone listening, it is our hope that you leave here with information, inspiration, and plans for action as you take your first steps towards having careers in STEM. Now, you can see here that we are at the National Air and Space Museum, <laughs> Stephen F. Uber Hazi Center, and I am here with Sharon Cables McDougall, former space shuttle crew escape equipment, suit technician, crew chief, and manager. And now, Alpha. Well, Sharon, it's so lovely to meet you. I'm so happy to be with you here. So let's go down and chat. Now today, I am here with our lovely speaker, Sharon McDougall. Yes. <laughs> well, I'm Sharon Capels McDougall, former space shuttle crew escape equipment space suit technician, crew chief, and manager, and author. So here, let's have our conversation. Tell us a little bit more about who you are, what you currently do, and anything that's necessary for our audience tonight. Okay. Well, I am from Moss Point, Mississippi. Happily married for 31 years, have two beautiful adult children, and a brand new friend, baby. Okay. Yes. He's almost four months old. Almost four months old. Yes. Almost four months old. <laughs> yeah. We're going to go to your childhoods first. Yes. And so I'm curious about if you had any STEM interests growing up mm -hmm. and what other hobbies outside of STEM and interests you had while growing up. So growing up, I did not. I loved school, but I didn't have any particular interests because, as I mentioned earlier, I had to go home. I didn't. I couldn't do extracurricular activities after school. I had to go straight home. So going to school was like a luxury for me. Mm -hmm. It was my getaway. It was my safe haven. I lost both my parents at a very young age. Uh, by the time I was in the second grade, both my parents had passed, and I had to live with my older sister. And me being eight years old, she already had her family of five kids, and I was older than all her kids. So it's like I had to grow up overnight. Wow. So, it, but it helped make me who I am today because I had to, you know, like leave the household at such a young age. So I would always have to go back home and do all my chores, and then do my homework, and then get up and do it all over again, comb everybody's hair, get everybody dressed, and lunch, and everything. So I had to do a lot. So I didn't have time to even dream about what I want to do, to be honest. So I had no idea. And then when I got around junior high, I think I started thinking about, you know, careers. In the sixth grade, I got to fly to Portland, Oregon to visit one of my other sisters. And I stayed with her during the sixth grade. And on the plane ride, I saw the flight attendants. And I was like, oh, they're so helpful. They're so nice. They're so pretty. Maybe that, that can be my job. Because mm -hmm. I didn't have anybody like steering me as far as, except at school, you know, to say, you know, what do you want to be? What do you want to do? Was that also your first time on a plane? First time. Yeah. Oh, wow. Sixth grade. So Did you I'm sit like, in the window seat? Of course. <laughs> of course, because I'm nosy. <laughs> I was like, what's out there? And I was, it was exciting. You know, I had never been anywhere from a small town, Moss Point, Mississippi. And so that was exciting. But even though uh, going to Portland, Oregon is where, I, where my sister was, it was, I got to do a lot of things I had never done. Saw a lot of things I'd never seen because I was like, say, a small town. Mm -hmm. But even though everything was great there, I still missed home. Even though I had all these chores, it was a normal part of my life now, you know? Yeah. And it, and it wasn't much going on there. So while I was in Portland, I mean, I went to the zoo for the first time. Um, I had never seen broccoli. I was like, what is that little tree on my plate? Cause you know, in the South it's greens and you know, so I had never even seen broccoli. So I <laughs> experienced broccoli for the first time. Did it taste good the first no. time? Because I'm used, you know how we cook in the South. It's like, well, I don't know if you know, but in the South, we like everything is seasoned and got meat in it. And so well, there were no little trees on my plate. Anyway, so I made it through sixth grade. Everything was great. Then I was like, okay, I think I want to go back to Mississippi. Even though I wanted to get away from Mississippi, but mm -hmm. I still missed it. It was still home. So I went back. And in junior high, I did break, except for algebra. And then, <laughs> and then I got to high school and I did great. And now I'm freaking out because I'm like, what am I going to do? I don't have any money to go to college. I don't, you know. So I'm kind of stressed. I was probably depressed, more than likely. Mm -hmm. And I'm still trying to figure out what I'm going to do. And I still didn't know. 
Because I thought, because my dad was prior army, I had heard, I don't remember how I heard it, but they were saying, oh, if, you, if your parents are military or whatever, they'll pay for your college. So I was betting on that. Mm-hmm. But that wasn't the case. If they did have that program, it wasn't going on anymore for me when, when I got to that point. So I'm stressed out. And then I see my knight in shining armor came and spoke to my class, the Air Force recruiter. <laughs> came and spoke to my class. I think it was around November of my senior year. And I raised my hand in the auditorium that day. I'm like, I'm ready right now. He's like, no, you can't. You got to be 18, first of all. And then you have to come down and test and then you know, get to enlisted and stuff. So on my 18th birthday, I went down, took the test, enlisted, and they choose your job. So it was easy. I didn't even know. I didn't still didn't know what I wanted to do. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought I was going to probably do something with kids because I had helped raise my five nieces and nephews all those years. Mm-hmm. So I thought maybe a kindergarten teacher, a baker or something. Then I was like, no. Nah. I don't want to be with kids anymore. You already have I'm, I'm, tired, I'm tired of taking care of kids. <laughs> you need a break. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so when he came and he just made it sound so wonderful and I was just like wide eyed and like, yes, that's what I'm going to do. That's my ticket out of Moss Point, Mississippi. And not that I hate my hometown. It just, it was no growth and opportunities there for me. Mm-hmm. And I knew it was bigger and better things out there for me. So um, when I enlisted, I went in, uh, did boot camp September 19th, I remember it. And I actually did a a uh, tandem jump on my anniversary of my Air Force, like later on when I was in my fifties. So, so yeah, 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 yes, girl, yes, exactly, <laughs> yes, fifty-five, not fifty-five. <laughs> okay, so uh, then high school I did great. I think I was number. We had like four hundred and thirty-six in our class, which was big for our school, and I was number twenty-three. I think number twenty-three out of the class, so I did pretty good. And I was always, uh, you know, very, very smart, very attentive, you know, always that kid to raise their hand. I wasn't shy. Well, once I got to high school, I wasn't shy. Mm-hmm. But before that, I was really shy and reserved because, you know, I didn't fit the mold. And then you get picked on when you're in the smart classes, too. And back then, it's, it's you and then it's all white kids in the smart class. And so you get picked on about that, and you're not as developed as the other person. You know, all this mm-hmm. kind of stuff was going on. There's always one thing after the other. Yeah, yeah. And you're so, not this, you're not that. Yeah, yeah. And so I just, you know, I just blocked all that out. But I was like, what you got going on? I, I just, I loved on me, because nobody else was doing it. <laughs> loved on me. So you got to be able to do that and pick up the pieces and just do your best. And so I enlisted, went to boot camp, and the job assigned to me, because they go by your scores, was aerospace physiology. Mm-hmm. And that's the job I went into with the Air Force. Oh, that's mm-hmm. That did jump ahead. <laughs> yeah. For that did jump ahead for what we're going to going into. Oh, that's that childhood. Oh. That, 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 was all way, that was all the way to eighteen. <laughs> it's true. It's true. <laughs> I do have one more question okay. about the childhood part. So it seems like that Air Force recruiter, um, or Army recruiter Air was Force. the one. Air Force recruiter mm-hmm. was the one who might have been a big influence for you, um, considering that he convinced you to join the Air Force. Mm-hmm. Um, but do you have any other like role models or influences while yes. growing up? Yes, uh, my second grade teacher, because after my mom was killed, a couple of blocks from our house, mm-hmm. might have been three blocks, but anyway, she was killed in a car accident by a driver under the influence. And you know, small town. I'm sure all the adults heard about it. And so I was a totally different child. I wasn't this, just like I am now, that's how I used to be as a kid until that happened. And then I was shut down. I didn't talk for a long time. I didn't want to go to school. I wasn't, you know, raising my hand in class. And I was just very, very just drawn back and just, just like, you know, just there. Just mm-hmm. staring out the window during class. And my second grade teacher, Mrs. Jennings, she noticed the change in me. So she started paying extra attention to me. Wow. Giving me the hugs I wasn't getting anymore. Because I'm a big girl at home now. My sister's not like, I'm, she got all her little babies. So I wasn't getting the love and hug and attention, hugs and attention that my mom was giving. Mm-hmm. And so Mrs. Jennings noticed the change and she started paying extra attention to me, you know, just making a big deal about like I did grades and just, just hugging me just for no reason type of thing because she knew I needed it. And it brought me out of my little funk that I was in because I was, oof, I was in that, I, in the second grade, you know. Mm-hmm. So I made it through that, and then, like I said, when I got closer, oh, so and Mrs. Owens in high school. And, of course, my sister, you know, I lived yeah. with her. You know, she taught me how to cook and clean and, you know, run a household pretty much. So I was a good leader already when I went to the military. I was already <laughs> a good leader. <laughs> and um, Mrs. You Owens. You had to Yeah, oh, <laughs> big time. Well, no, I was doing everything. Oh. I was doing everything. Um, and Mrs. Owens in, in high school, 
she's one of those teachers that made you feel like, and I, and I felt like it was just me. She, I'm sure she probably heard of other students, but she was my teacher. That's it. <laughs> so she made me feel like I could do and do anything, even though I still didn't know what I wanted to do. But when I just, when I'm just in her presence, I would automatically show those back a little more. You know, that, that kind of teacher just made you feel like you can just fly mm-hmm. and you could do anything. And just her tone of her voice, everything. And what she wrote in my, my memory book, I mean, I just loved her. She, I just felt good just being in her presence. I would see her down the hall. She don't even see me, but I would automatically, you know, you just feel proud, you know, you feel a little proud or walk a little tall and mm-hmm. certainly see her. Cause I know how she felt about me and how she lifted me up all the time. And so she definitely helped me uh, through the high school years and I started freaking out and not knowing what I'm gonna do. So those two people were, were uh, major in my life. That's so beautiful. It really shows that good teachers really make a difference. Yes. And how people grow up and the things that they become interested in as well. Mm-hmm. Well, they say if they just reach one, I was definitely one of those mm-hmm. ones they reached. I'm really happy that they were there for you, especially during a difficult time. Like losing parents is always very difficult. But yeah. So moving into the Air Force, you didn't go to college. You were like, mm, I'm going straight into the Air Force. So Look, I went in to go to college, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> so why did you decide to join the Air Force and what position did you serve? I know we kind of mentioned okay. earlier, but. Let's do it again. <laughs> I decided to go into the Air Force because I thought it would be a great opportunity for me. Mm-hmm. And when he mentioned traveling the world, that was a key thing for me to travel. I wanted to go see different stuff. I didn't care about the job, to be honest. But I got a pretty cool job out of it. So I got placed, and as I mentioned, uh, you have to take a test to go into the military. And they use your test scores in the different sections and decide where to place you in your, in your career. Mm-hmm. And of course, where they need people to. Because the first job they offered me was air traffic controller. Mm-hmm. But I would have had to uh, graduate high school early. And my principal, thank you, Dr. Burkett, for not letting me graduate early because I heard that air traffic control was highly stressful. Okay. This was during Reagan era when they had went on strike. And so they were trying to bring in oh, people who were trained. Okay. Yeah. And so she said, I don't want to set that precedent. And, you know, I let you graduate early because I had the grades. That wasn't a problem. But she just didn't want everybody to start asking to graduate early. And so she said no. And so I had to go tell the recruiter I can't leave early. So after I graduated in May, uh, like I said, I went to boot camp and everything. And then you go to your technical school, which was the School of Aerospace Medicine at Brooks Air Base, Air Force Base in San Antonio. And that's where we learned about the physiological effects on the body with altitude changes and all that good stuff. And then the suits weren't part of that. That, that was only at when I got to my base. Mm-hmm. That's okay. when the suits came into play. Okay. So I see you, like, you learned a little bit of physics. Yes. <laughs> that's actually like, my area okay. of expertise. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. So you did mention the Air Force Base, let's mm-hmm. mention it one more time. So which Air Force Base were you stationed at? Mm-hmm. And what did a typical work week at the Air Force Base look like? I was stationed at Bill Air Force Base in California. And I thought, oh, I'm going to go to California. Move stars. <laughs> no. West Coast. No. I was up in Northern California. Uh, <laughs> in the middle of nowhere because the aircraft, the spy planes were out there. So mm-hmm. we were way out in the middle of nowhere, girl. We were about, yeah, <laughs> about an hour from Sacramento. So that was the big city nearby, was Sacramento. Mm-hmm. So we were stationed there. Uh, typical day was the U-2 and SR-71, they flew every day. The weekends, not so much, but on the weekdays, yes. So you had a, it was like a regular job. People think the military, oh, you need to get ready to go out and fight. But no, there are jobs that aren't, you know, there's no mission, you know, shooting, all that. Even though I got to shoot, and I did better than the boys. Oh, really? But we'll talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, a typical day was we go in, there's a huge board that has all the flights listed. And like I asked about the tail number on the SR-71 out there, they would have the, the plane and the crew and what time they were scheduled to take off and stuff. And you'd be assigned to whichever ones you need. And you come in, you have to get the pilot's physical. Well, they eat breakfast and you them like a quick little, you know, mm-hmm. blood pressure check and pulse. Checking their vitals. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then they go put on their underwear and their urinary collection. <laughs> 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 and they walk out and they get the lazy boy. And we suit them up just like I just suited up on your cohort. Yes. So that's how it would go. And then I will, after, um, I, I'm sorry, before I suit them up, I take the survival kit, it's a seat kit, and the parachute out to the aircraft and load the aircraft. Mm-hmm. So you have to go up this stair. It's, it's a tall ladder that goes up to the cockpit. The U2s were low, was lower, of course. We just had a kind of a step ladder for that one. But for the SR-71, it was a really tall ladder with a platform. And so you load the aircraft. And mind you, this is when I was a little bitty thing. I was about 90 pounds soaking wet because I was 18, you know. And so I would have to carry this heavy equipment up. 
and care. And this is the one of the instances they asked earlier. It's like, you know, I never got treated like, oh, let me help you, little girl, or nothing like that. You know, I was always just treated like a, just a worker, a regular mm-hmm. worker. Nobody, you know, tried to baby me or anything because I was tiny. So I would load the aircraft, drive the van back to the building, sit up the app, I dash not the pilot, <laughs> sit up the pilot, and get them all zipped up and helmet and everything, and then test them and make sure the leaks are proper and that the oxygen is flowing where it's supposed to. And they actually had to pre breathe for the pilots an hour prior to the to be taking them out. Oh. To help get up nitrogen as much nitrogen out of the system okay. to prevent um or anything like that. Oh, kind of like when you go swimming deep. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. So I go back and take them out and then we strap them in. They, you know, I, they have a list of what they want to eat and drink. So they had two food and then they had a bottle with a long straw. They have a little hole in the helmet right here. Okay. So they can stick their two food in and eat it or they can stick the bottle of whatever liquid, usually Gatorade, and they, they can eat that really well. Because the SR will fly about two and a half hours. But the YouTube would fly like eight to nine hours. They'd be oh. gone all day. So that's so why they have the two food. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Only thing with that tube food though, it can make you have a blower. Ooh. Yeah. I'm mm-hmm. rolling a couple of soups. I'm rolling a couple of soups. Because it's two food. It's like baby food. Mm-hmm. You know? So yeah, that's the only bad part because they didn't wear diapers. So Oh they didn't. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah. Did you take a note <laughs> from NASA and wear diapers? Well the NASA actually got the suits from the Air Force. Oh really? Everybody thinks because it's NASA that they got it from the Air Force. Oh. Okay. Yeah. So now moving on to your work with NASA, what made you decide to move from the Air Force to NASA? Well, it wasn't a decision in that instance like that. Okay. So what happened was um, at my unit in the Air Force, things were changing and I didn't like the way they were going. Mm-hmm. I felt it was turning into a retirement home. Like some of the sergeants and stuff that were getting ready to separate from the service, they would come and come to our unit for like their last who were off. And all of a sudden, in the military, you know, the more stripes you got, of course, you're the smartest. Mm-hmm. And we know that ain't true. <laughs> but anyway, that's how it worked, though. So now these people are coming here. They're doing pretty much a tour of our building. They don't even know the job, but now they're over me. And they're going to be responsible for watching me and making sure I'm doing my job. Right. And they don't even know the job. So I had a problem with that. I was like, they're going to kill somebody and they're going to hurt somebody because this guy doesn't know what he's doing. And so I made the decision, even though I had planned on going to do 20 years and retire. I mean, I was all about, I loved the military. So it was nothing against the military as a whole. It was mm-hmm. just how things were going at my sure unit. Thing. Yeah, so yeah. it was time for me to go. And so I, I did seven years, and I decided to take the early out. They offer early out, like, when you get close to your end of your term. And I took it. How without a plan. That? Without a plan. Oh. That's a problem. So have a plan. <laughs> Wait, but how long is the term? Oh, four years. Four years? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think the army, I think they do three at a time, but I had four. And um, so I was in my little fast butt, and I'm just gonna leave. <laughs> <laughs> and boy, look, that was a mistake. Oh. That was a mistake because when I got out, I didn't know that it was gonna be a struggle. See, all I've done my whole adult life is be in the military. Mm-hmm. So that's all I knew. You're on a fixed schedule, like you had set. You know what you're gonna wear every yeah. day. <laughs> Three room and board, you know, go to the child hall. So I had I hadn't really been an adult. Wow. You know? And that's what gut punched me when I left the military. It's like, thank God my college paid off because I had been in over five years, you know, because mm-hmm. I would have been hurting. So a friend of mine that was my roommate when she was in the service, she had gotten out two years before me. She was living in Sacramento in her own place. Thank goodness, because I don't know what I would do. So she let me sleep on her futon. And y'all know futon mean the definition of futon is hard. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but I had a roof over my head and you know she allowed me to stay there and I gave her a little bit here and there. So even though I was super awesome, amazing in the Air Force, nobody wanted to hire you full time. Wow. And like where are you gonna you know, I worked on pressure suits for seven years. Where where, <laughs> where am I going? Yeah. Um, and we didn't know about soft skills back then. It's like, what are soft skills? That, that wasn't a thing then. So I stayed at her place for six months. I couldn't find good employment, you know. So I had three jobs, part-time. They would give me like four to six hours each one because they didn't want to give me benefits. Mm-hmm. So at nighttime, I cleaned the office building. You know, the best office building cleaner they'd ever seen. Uh, and I always tell the kids, whatever you're doing, do your best to, to set it. 
In the daytime, I had two jobs. I would stock the shelves at Office Depot for about four hours, and then I'll go to a department store and put price tags on clothes. Like it felt like child labor, slave labor. Wow. We was like in a basement, hot. Oh my God. <laughs> but I had to do. I had to do to get some money. You know? Yeah. You have to survive. It's exactly. You know, I was in survival mode. So I worked these three jobs for six months. And as I tell everybody, it's like, oh, you made history. You worked this special. I'm like, yeah, I don't know. She was struggling before that. So. <laughs> um, and then April call. This is before Google, Facebook, all this stuff, cell phones. And one of the guys I was in the Air Force with, um, he called. He remembered. He tracked me down. Because it was only phone books back then. He, he remembered my roommate's name from the Air Force. And he called her. Found her in the home up and called her apartment. And I just happened to be there between them 15 jobs. And, <laughs> and, and he told me Sharon has an immediate opening doing the same thing we do in the Air Force. And that's why I said my sponsors, he'd already primed them, told them how awesome I was and everything. So I didn't even have to do an interview. It's like I called and he pretty much said, now, and I had planned out, I was walking on water on this interview on the phone. I was already ready to give it to him. And he was like, no, just come out whenever you're ready. I'm like, this ain't real. <laughs> It's just, <laughs> it's, you know, you look at the ball like, and he was like, no, no, really. And I'm like, really, really? It's a supervisor. It was Jim Howard, remember his name? And he's like, yeah, uh, Low Water told, told us all about you. And it was already, uh, I think it was three or four other people from my unit in the military already working with NASA. Wow. Already there. But Lobo's the one that spoke my name into that room. You know, he put my name in that room and let them know, hey, y'all might want to get her. Because he could have called anybody else that used to be in the service with us, you know. Mm -hmm. But he chose me. So I'm forever grateful. Forever grateful to him. That's so amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, never know who, you know, always do your best. Because you never know who's going to put your name out there and let people know about you. So, I drove there uh, from California to Texas. July 9th, 1990 is when I started. Wow. You drove all the way back home. Oh, <laughs> I could never do that. Girl by myself. I was a truck driver. Wow. I was playing. <laughs> <laughs> but I had done it before just just because I drove to Atlanta, you know, just mm -hmm. hanging out. So I wasn't afraid of driving, but um, then that was an exciting drive, too. Oh, my God. Because I was like, oh, my God, I can't believe I got this job. You know, I still didn't know exactly what was going to be going on. But when I got there, I just blew mm -hmm. running because I've already been doing it for seven years. You know, what was it like when you, like, walked in on campus? Like. <sighs> What is it like Mary Tyler Moore? I don't know if you remember the show, but she just stands there and spin around like, ah! <laughs> I'm here. What do I do? What do I do? You know, I'm just excited, girl. And I already knew once I get there, you know, I'm gonna look because she, she does her stuff. You're the expert. Expert. The spurt. Yes, ma'am. So I get there, um, and we were on site at the time, but eventually our, our, we moved off into a bigger building because the room was kind of small with all the stuff we had to do. So I get there, and uh, like I said, I was the first black CWC technician. And I didn't even think about it then, you know what I'm saying? I was just like, I got a job. And I found out about the ratings, like it's A, B, and C tech. And they brought me in as a C tech, and you know what I found out about that. I raised a little saying, and they moved up to B tech. So because of me, they started bringing in Air Force people at the median level and still at the bottom. Because we still have to learn the way they do things, you know, yeah. and their policies and changes. So in the Air Force, we did everything. And mm -hmm. you know, it's like once you learn it, it's like you're not following, you're not reading it. Like in with NASA, you gotta read everything. Yeah. So I got dumber when I got there. I really did. I got dumber when I got to, to the space program. So what is a spacesuit technician and why was that role or why is that role important? Okay. Spacesuit technician for the crew escape equipment department was the orange pressure suits worn by all of the astronauts that flew aboard the space shuttle. Whether they came from another country to fly on the space shuttle, man, woman, whoever, if they flew on the space shuttle, they had to wear the pressure suit. And my job actually came about after the Challenger accident. Oh. I was still in the Air Force when that happened, and I was actually watching it on TV. I was on dorm duty, dorm guard duty, and I was like, and I didn't think that was real. I'm not thinking in a million years I was going to be working the space program, but I was yeah. watching the launch, and I saw it. I, 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 was, I actually saw it explode on TV, and I'm like, what in the world? And you thinking it's not real, but it is real. So when, you know, when accidents happen, unfortunately, they start thinking of anything they can do to make things safer and better. And, mm -hmm. you know, and one of the things that came out is to start back wearing a pressure suit because they weren't right. Not that it'll help if the, if the rocket explodes. It's not yeah. right. As we saw at Columbia. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, so that's what brought my job about. And that was in, uh, that was in 86, I think, when that happened, when the Challenger exploded. That sounds about right. I think it was 86. And so I got out in 1990. Wow. Yeah, so... Um, that's what brought the job about. And so it was only 
probably about seven or eight suit techs when I got there. Now the EMU suit, the white suit, they you know they had a different department and that's a whole different thing. So I didn't work with that suit, so I couldn't tell you much about it. Except I got to put it on and play in it. <laughs> Got some good pictures. I heard they're pretty yeah. heavy. Was it pretty yeah. like you have trouble moving your arms? Uh, the the EMU is up on a stand, so oh. it's not, you're not walking around in a whole suit. So remember, they'll get out, they're floating, so they don't yeah. like that when they're out in space. But um, yeah, it's heavy. It's very heavy. The pants you have to walk in. I had to pull the pants up and kind of take those to get onto the dining stand because the other the I think it's called the EMU, the top part, the arms and the and the torso is sitting up on a stand. So I got the pants on, so now I gotta bend down like this and get up under the torso and go up under it like that. Um, and put my arms in and then my head pop out and then they'll connect the pants to the upper torso. Mm-hmm. And you know, with our suit used to be, I told you guys, I just lay that on the floor. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's like a baby space shuttle for EMU is because they're doing space walk in it, you know, so it's gotta protect them. So the suit is uh, for if they had a lost cabin pressure aboard the orbiter. The suit would sense the change in cabin pressure and it would automatically pressurize and keep them at a safe altitude inside the suit mm-hmm. until they got down to a low enough altitude that they need to bail out. And it's also for if they did bail out for hypothermia purposes and it's orange so it can be seen easily. You know, orange is an international health color. But be careful if you see somebody walking around in an orange suit because you know a lot of prisoner suits are orange. Mm-hmm. So you want to make sure you're helping the astronaut not <laughs> have numbers so if you see no one's on the back of the suit yeah, yeah it's yeah. wrong suit yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> go the other way <laughs> so what were the differences between the orange suits and the suits you worked with with the pilots were there any differences at all? very minimal slight because remember they got the suits from there oh that's true so the main thing that changed was the color of it and then they had liquid cooling garments the mm-hmm. underwear the special underwear that the astronauts wore because they don't have regular light hair conditioning like we have and then you're lying out on a pad in Florida for three hours with no cooling. You try to pass oh. out. Yeah, they have a, some type of big holes that went in to try to cool off the cabin, but still inside the suit with your helmet clothes and all that, it's very hot. But the liquid cooling garment worked extremely well. They actually got that idea from some race car drivers. Oh, because they were inside their little hot cockpits and they're going 200 and something miles an hour. They work with liquid cooling. Under their suits, so so now it's here combining knowledge from like exactly, exactly. exactly. Don't reinvent the wheel, mm-hmm. you know. Just make it fit what you need to do. And so they uh, started wearing that, and a lot of them only wore the top because it got so cold. You got this cold water right against your skin. Wow. Even though it's under the suit, it's right against your skin. <laughs> and they and they controlled it. They could turn it off and on, mm-hmm. you know. But it was super super cold water, and I forgot what the chemical was that was there to keep it so cold. It's been too long. But anyway, it was super cold water. And it helped a lot because before that, with that suit that was over here, the LES, it was just ambient air. We put the holes up and we just got there. <laughs> but it just moved it around. But at least it was something, you know. It didn't have to cool like an air duct. Yeah, exactly. It was just like, hey, it's warm, but at least it's moving around. <laughs> yeah. Spain yourself. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that, that's where that came from. And then, you, as I mentioned earlier, the helmet and the, um, in the Air Force, the helmet, the differences in the helmet was, Astronauts have a neck seal, and in the helmet in the Air Force, it, you had a face seal instead of a neck seal. Mm, okay. So with for claustrophobia, it would be horrible because it's like it's like this, about this much of your face showing. Wow. So the seal would be all around your face. Some of the pilots wore, which I thought was odd. I thought they had to like have perfect vision. Some of them actually wore glasses too. Oh, so really? we had little mm-hmm. Velcro things on the side where they could slide their arms or their glasses in and Velcro. Don't hold them. Mm-hmm. So that yeah, I like I like it better with the neck seal. Mm-hmm. I don't like having the things like that smooshed. Do any astronauts have to also wear glasses? Uh, astronauts, yeah, because you know, the only ones that have to really do anything is a, a pilot because they're going to be flying it. You know, mm-hmm. the other ones are like, oh, you got a flight deck and a mid deck. So the flight deck will be the commander pilot and this one MS2. Commander pilot and the MS1 MS2. Something like that. Anyway, I don't want to get it mixed up. But anyway, it's <laughs> a so flight deck and a mid deck. <laughs> and it's four, yeah, it's the main problem as well as two and flight day. Yeah, that's right. And then you got the lower level for the other MSs. And so they would get in and they get strapped in. And our company got the um, contract to do it towards the end. So we, like when I was in the Air Force, we had to do everything. Mm-hmm. It's like in the middle, you did everything. Then I got to the space program. I was like, no, you just suit them up. That's it. I'm like, what? I ain't got to do this. I got that. Suit them up. <laughs> but I don't do this. No. 
So, <laughs> I can't ask that trying to do all this stuff. Because that's what I do to do it every day. It's like, you you know, they teach you one in the Air Force. It's pretty much like, okay, you got it. You can teach that, that new person come in. <laughs> Just like, it's broke, fix it. Got to NASA, baby. It was like something I know how to fix. It might take five minutes for me to fix it. No, we gotta wait and let the quality inspector write a discrepancy report, and then the engineer will get the discrepancy report, and they'll come down and talk to you about it, so you can tell them how to fix it. And then they write it on a piece of paper. So it can be, be hours, sometimes days. You just like so you had to learn how to just chill. I'm, but I'm always used to like constant like moving, mm-hmm. working, get it, get it done, break it, fix it, get it, just move. And I, it's like Arr! got time. Brain cells leaving. <laughs> Brain cells are leaving. Just bring a book in the hammock. It's serious. I'm saying it's, it was so much slower, and I was just like, it used to bother me. Really? Oh yeah. Oh, was, you the culture change. Yeah. The culture change was a little hard on me that first year, and then I finally blew sod and, and jumped on board with the slow moving. <laughs> Don't be in a rush. Just take your time and read. It was terrible. I used to know all the torques by heart. I used to know everything by heart. Then it was like, oh, I can't remember. I was like, I gotta read it. Oh, the my- but that's all right. It still looked that good. I love my job. I'm not saying nothing about it, man, mm-hmm. about it. But it's just, I'm just comparing it to how it looked at Air Force. Yeah. Yeah. Air Force is, but much more about high paced Yes. yes. This one like is. I said, we were flying every day. Whereas, sure. uh, you know, the space shuttle flying now. Yeah. So, what was it like working with the astronauts? And can you also tell me your favorite memory from working with all of them? Overall, most of them were very nice people, and I had a good time with them. I'd say we, they're training a whole year before they go to space mm-hmm. with, with the suited events, and they'll do approximately 25 to 30 suited events so they can get used to what to do on their space because we won't be there, mommy won't be there mm-hmm. to do anything, and so we train them on the proper way to don and off the suit and what everything's for, how it works, um, how to, they have like a little duffel bag, they have to pack everything up once they get to space to put it away. And just, you know, to be gentle, you know, because you damage the suit, I'm not up there to fix it either. You mm-hmm. know, so just watch what you're doing. And they learn all that stuff, and they practice in the simulator, flying in it so they can feel how everything feels, and, you know. And so the favorite memory, of course, is <sighs> working with our first black woman to go to space, Dr. Mae Jemison. That will always be one of the top ones. I mean, I had many fun times. I mean, many, but that is definitely the most special to me, you know, because it's like that kinship, you know, family, I'm taking care of her. Well, not even think about the whole making history part. I was just excited the first black moment going to space. You know how you feel like, oh, that's my sister. That's my real sister going to space. <laughs> so I wanted to make sure that she was well taken care of. And, you know, I was one of the best. <laughs> <All right>. <laughs> <laughs> toot, toot. And I don't want to do Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but but to for real. Two, two. <laughs> <laughs> so I just wanted to make sure she didn't have to worry about anything. Because you know, you never know how somebody yeah. And you know, while she's doing I uh, got all these other things going on, I wanted her to make sure she knew that all of her crew escape equipment was gonna be on point. Mm-hmm. She didn't have to worry about nothing. That needs to be the last thing she needs to be worried about. Worry about all of your experiments you gotta do and all that stuff. This equipment is good. Anything you need, I'm your girl. Mm-hmm. So that was definitely my most to see her. It was just like electricity was in the room. She came in on actual pumps morning and sat down. And she walked in the room. And it was kind of like that first day when she walked in for fit check. It was just like, oh, you know, it's like, oh. And so she came in. And I went through the motions. We chatted and stuff. And before she walked out, I gave her a hug. You know, before she walked out. When they walk out and you see them uh, walking out the door waiting and standing in front of that big silver van, they just left the suit up with them where we were. And so we were right out behind them. And we'll park in the uh, area where the press park is about three miles out, I think, if I remember right. About three miles from the pad, just in case something happened, we got to go out and get it. So, yeah, that was my most favorite. And then uh, I think STS 44 was my first night. Yeah. And that's what Freddie Gregory uh, commanded. And that was special too, because it looks really pretty at night. Still don't mess with the SR 71, but it looks pretty. <laughs> Still can't go pay. I was going to ask, like, what was it like watching your first launch? Girl, I'm proud to be an American. <laughs> That's how I feel. <laughs> I'm like, ah, girl. And you could, I mean, you could feel it all through your body. All the, mm-hmm. And even when they come back, when they get in land, they do that little sonic boom when they fly over the building. They're home. They're home. Let's go get them. But no, you feel super proud. And to, you know, see your work go full circle. You know, okay, that's what we've been preparing for all this time. 
Mm-hmm. And we had a successful launch. You know, and it's just like, you do, you feel so proud. You feel so proud. It's my baby. The discovery that's almost cried this morning when I saw her sitting Aww. there. I was like, so many, just so many things just washed over me. And to see that SR in the, <sighs> her, amazing. Just so many memories, so many great times. And just, I'm just so fortunate to have worked with both of those amazing vehicles. I mean, just blessed beyond measure. So it's been a bit since you retired from NASA. Yeah. And so now, as you are you're traveling and doing all sorts of cool things now, do you still, so you didn't have any hobbies growing up because you were busy taking care of the family. Yeah. But now that you have more time for yourself, <laughs> <laughs> do you have any hobbies and interests now? Uh, I found it's a word for word cosplay. I love to dress up in a costume. Oh! I didn't know. My son told me it's cosplay. I was like, cosplay? <laughs> what is Dressing up in a costume. Yeah. He's like, no, it's called cosplay. So I went to one of those things with him, like Comic Palooza or something. <laughs> yeah, so much fun. I'm a big kid. But uh, I love to play dress up. So I would, uh, before I wrote my own book, I would go out to daycares and community events and stuff. And if I'm reading a book, I would actually pick the book to go with my costume. So whatever costume I like. <laughs> I'll take a book to go with the costume. And the kids adore it. Oh my God, they get so geeked if you come with a costume and you're reading to them. So make it fun and memorable for them, you know? So, and then when I wrote my own book, that's easy, just wear orange too. And I go out and read to them and they're all surprised. You wrote the book? You actually wrote it? Because they think I'm still just coming to read to them. I'm like, no, I wrote it and you can write a book too. I've had a couple of kids say, I'm going to write a book too. I want to be an author, you know? And that just, oh, that just melts my heart. And one of the girls took the stuff first. I'm gonna have a glossary. I'm like, oh, what? Are we write a textbook? <laughs> I'm gonna have a glossary in my book. What you trying to say? My book don't have a glossary. <laughs> I'm gonna do one better than you, Miss McDougal. <laughs> so yeah, it, and just to see their little faces light up, I mean, it just means the world. Cause I get all down on the floor with them, girl. I be loving it, loving it. So one of my favorite ones was a uh, tickle monster. I have a little dinosaur tail and a little hand. Oh, she said I read this book to it. I'm chasing them all around the room to tell the little daycare kids. But anyway, I digress. But yeah, dressing in a costume and hanging out with my family, period. I love to go to uh, Broadway shows and musicals. Love pretty much anything. Love Tina Turner. You can't tell me I'm not Tina Turner. Diana Ross. Mm-hmm. I'm going to show you some pictures out there. Baby, she got Diana Ross dead. Ooh. I went to her concert in Vegas. I was in the lobby waiting on my daughter. You know I dressed like it when I went. People thought I was like, you were coming up taking pictures. You got a lot of pictures. I was a lie. It was a lie, girl. A lot of people went there and pictures with me. And I'm like, oh, I saw you in 1969. You were amazing. I'm like, oh, that's so sweet. Come on, baby. But anyway, I'm sorry. But yeah, I like to dress up. I like to dress up in. It would have been amazing if Diana Ross like invited you on stage. Oh, with her. If I would have had a four seat, oh. I bet you she would have invited yeah. me on stage. Because I looked just like her that night. I looked just like her. Yeah. Oh, so big. Oh, man. Yeah, but speaking of your book, what's yeah. the name of your book? And how long did it take for you to develop the book? So the name of my book is Suit Up for Launch with Shay. Because I'm Shay. And I'll be sitting you up. Have a seat. No. <laughs> So uh, I wanted to write a book while I was still there because I did a lot of community and school events. And and I, then I thought, well, there might be a lot of red tape. They might say, you can't say this, you can't say that. Or, you, you know, and I was like, you know, I'll just wait. I'll put it on the back burner. And then it burned up. I forgot about it. <laughs> so you might try to put something on the back burner. I close it up. I close it back there. And so COVID created a lot of authors because <laughs> we had to sit our butt still and we couldn't do nothing else. So I was like, okay, this is the perfect time for me to go and just knock it out. It took probably about 30 minutes to write it. It didn't take long because what I did for 22, for almost 30 years, including Air Force. And so I made it, I wanted to make it a, I didn't just want to just say, like, da 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 I wanted to make it a conversation between a mother and daughter mm-hmm. because I truly miss my mom. And so in the book, the mother and Shay, they're both me because I'm a suit tech, the mom is me. And then little Shay, who's around seven years old, you know. Wish I could have had that conversation or been hanging out with my mom. Too. So I kind of based it on that, a mother and daughter conversation. And well, you heard a little bit of it. You know, she decided she wanted to play dress up, and mom's like, make it a teachable moment. Before you put that suit on, let me tell y'all about it. You know, 
And so that's what brought that on. And like I said, very easy to write because I'm, I'm going to have a series. It'll be like Suit Up to Die because my husband is a diver oh, with NASA. Okay. So it'll be Suit Up to Die with Shay and, you know, different things like that. I'm going to keep a little series going. Suit Up to Just Plain with Shay. So um, I always wanted to write a book because I love reading kids. I love kids. And I'm so happy to have my grandbaby, Landry. Oh. I so I'm going to have to write one with him in it, too. I'm definitely going to have to write one with him in it. And so that's what brought it on. And I want to leave my legacy and let people learn about the orange suit. Because, you know, when you think of NASA, you only think about the white suit, pretty much. Yeah. Even though you see them, they all have to wear the orange when we go back to them. And so I want to make sure they knew it's not just a costume. This is actually life-sustaining equipment. So you need to know about this suit. You need to learn about it in a fun and educational way. That's what we're doing. Yeah. Okay. So we're reaching the end, and I have two final questions for you. So the one is, what does black slash African American representation in STEM mean to you? It means that we have to keep pushing our babies in that direction. That's what it means. You know, we can't just, you know, you can, they can't just think about athletes and, and being a singer. And and nowadays with a TikTok star or whatever, or a social media star, you got to really have something else. You got to have something that's sustenance. And STEM is that. That's it. You know, science, technology, engineering, math, and the arts, STEAM. I've seen mm -hmm. that one a lot, too. So you got to be well-rounded, you know, and it's not just STEM, it's in everyday life. So we got to make sure our babies are knowing that, you know, not just have them plopped in front of a TV or a computer on their phone. You have to let them know that the things you do every day from, you know, measuring something to make it to cooking ingredients, you know, measuring ingredients, that's STEM. You know, you're going to um, play on their phone. I know that they think you're just playing on the phone, but that's technology. So it's still part of STEM. But break it down for them where they understand, make some comparisons, some real life stuff, so they'll know how STEM is affected, affecting their lives. So we gotta we gotta put forth more effort, not just depend on the teachers to do it. You know, mm -hmm. sending kids mistakes it's all up. And teachers and teachers know we're their teachers too. That you, you need to do your part as a parent to make sure that they're getting the knowledge and know how important STEM is. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And my final question: What advice do you have for members of our audience that want to follow a similar path as you? Uh, I would suggest that, I mean, I was just very fortunate because my job, my career chose me. Mm -hmm. to, but if you do know what you want to do, to focus on that path, I would also reach out to anybody that's already doing what you want to do as a mentor or a sponsor or however you want, or just to, just to chat, you know, mm -hmm. it might not be a long-term relationship with you. But focus on what you want to do, the pathway to get there, and always know that you can change directions at any time. And that's for grown-ups, too. You don't have to, just because you decide to be a veterinarian in the second grade, that means you have to stay on that path until you get to be an adult. You can change your mind, you know. And even once you get in school, you can change your mind. Parents might not like it, but <laughs> you can change your mind as you like. And then as an adult, as I mentioned, you can always switch and move around, do something different. Even if you're at a job, like working with a space program, um, my husband's an example. He started off working in the tool lab. The tools that go on the white suit, the EMU suit. Mm -hmm. He felt like, ah, that's not challenging enough. He moved to the actual working on the suits and putting them in the suit before he got into the pool to train. And then he was like, yeah. feel like something else was out there for him. Mm -hmm. So he went and got Patty certified and he put it, and he tested for the job to be a diver. And he got it. Wow. So he moved around and he didn't have a college degree either. And a lot of kids probably don't know if there's even an opportunity to be a diver. You know, mm -hmm. so he's a camera camera diver. So he's underwater recording them while they're training, so they can look mm -hmm. back at it later to see what they did right or wrong, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And he also, instead of bringing a mop up out the water, it's so big. If something's broken, he can go down and repair it in real time underwater. So okay. that's another job opportunity that, that kids probably don't know about. Well, that's cool. Well, Sharon, thank you so much for sharing your story mm -hmm. and spending time with us and teaching us all about the cool things that you did while mm -hmm. being in the Air Force and also being with NASA. And to everyone watching, thank you for joining us with National Museum of African American History and Cultures Through the Window and Into the Mirror, a career conversation series. Before you go, please remember, history is made doing ordinary tasks extraordinarily well over long periods of time. Goodbye, everyone.